we would first like to welcome Michael Weiss. Come on, girl. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, who just was a finalist. He was a finalist at the uh, uh, at, at the, the, the Crummer Pitch competition and uh, got a cash prize. With that. So we're very excited to have you here. Do share. So he's a new sponsor. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, he already gave us the building. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet all of you, and, and thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Michael Weiss. I'm co-founder and CEO of RoomWrite, and I'm excited to share with you how our company is helping event professionals avoid spending billions of dollars on empty hotel rooms for their events. So if you've ever traveled out of town for a conference or a trade show, you probably know that these type of events typically have a host hotel and a special group ready for you to stay at that hotel. These Discounted uh, rooms that are set aside for events are commonly known as a room block. Have you all heard that term before? Great. Have any of you heard of room attrition before? So this is an aspect of room blocks. These are the unfilled rooms within a room block. This is a big problem. I'm about to show you why. Let's say I'm planning a conference and I need 300 hotel rooms for my event for three nights at $200 a night. A hotel isn't just going to hold 300 hotel rooms and hope that I fill them. Instead, they're going to make me sign a contract guaranteeing that all those rooms get paid for. So if I only fill 90% of my room block, I'm going to get hit with an $18,000 invoice for 30 hotel rooms I have absolutely no use for. Let's look at this problem at a macro level. So the meetings and events industry's median attrition rate is 10%. So roughly 10% of a room block is empty. Depending on the size of the room uh, block and the level of attrition, Event professionals that we spoke with have paid anywhere between $10,000 and $250,000 per event for these empty hotel rooms. And globally, the industry pays over $21 billion. Yeah. So our solution is a marketplace where event professionals can resell their excess rooms to other groups and travelers. So to sell, print listing on our website uh, up to 120 days before your event, and you're going to include your dates, rates, the number of rooms that are available to be resold, and the hotel information. Buyers can see all the listings and book any quantity of rooms within a listing, but it must be a minimum of 10 rooms, and it must be uh, reserved at least 30 days before the arrival date. So how would anyone use our platform? Well, if you're stuck with all these hotel rooms, our platform will give you a way to mitigate your financial liability. Looking to buy rooms, there's a couple of perks. One, you're receiving the rate of the larger group. So now a 30 person group is getting the rate of a 300 person group. And we're the only ones that can offer that. You're also getting access to sold out hotels and markets. So right now, there are more events on the books in 2024 than there were before the pandemic. So it is really difficult or really expensive to get rooms, especially in, in popular markets for, uh, for a block of rooms. But we're reopening an inventory that is considered publicly unavailable, but is actually available. And so that's allowing groups to get in to the market or the hotel that they want at a better rate. And because you can see the availability, the, the dates and the rates, there's no need for a group to go through the RFP process and wait weeks for a response. They can book, book instantly and get all the information they need up front. Even hotels benefit. So right now when hotels go to collect their attrition fees, that uh, event is going to say, I'm going to pay you, but I'm never doing business with you again. So we all know that it's easier to retain business than it is to get new. So by mitigating the frequency or the significance of the attrition fees, they're more likely to retain their client. Also, we're bringing the hotel a new group, which not only solves a short-term problem, but now the hotel can build future business opportunities with that new group, and we do not charge a commission, whereas everybody else does. The hotel can also add additional services like the food and beverage credits and other products and services to generate incremental revenue off the rooms uh, that they weren't otherwise able to do. So how do we make money? We charge 15% of the room nights sold to the seller. If you look at the earlier example, instead of having 30 rooms and being charged $18,000, let's say I put 30 rooms on my marketplace, on the room right marketplace. Half of them sell. 
is still going to owe the hotel $9,000. That's a lot better than $18,000. The other group's going to cover the remaining nine. The roommate's going to charge me 15% uh, of the room night sold. And overall, I've saved almost $8,000 by using this service. How big is the market? Globally, the meetings and events industry spends over $21 billion in these empty rooms. In the U.S., where we're going to be focused, given our geography and our resources connections, it's about a third of the market. And we believe we can service $100 million in attrition uh, by 2028. So how do we find the buyers and the sellers? Well, luckily for us, they're the same uh, uh, persona. So we can do partnerships with like, the Visit Orlando's of the world, the CDBs, and, and also housing firms. These are groups that manage all the logistics of hotels for big conferences. Also through trade, trade media like SCIF meetings, which we're already featured in, uh, as well as some other publications. Professional associations like Meeting Planners International. This has contact information, networking opportunities, sponsorship opportunities for us to engage directly with who we want to uh, meet. There's also hosted buyer events where we're guaranteed one-on-one -on -one appointments with exactly who we want to meet. And then also we have a commission-based referral program for Meeting Planners because they're always they're always interacting with each other. So they might as well uh, make some incremental revenue off of, off of recommending our, our service. So what does the competitive landscape look like? Well, groups right now, when they're booking large blocks of hotel rooms, they either go directly to the hotel or to a third party. Individuals, you know all the places you can go to book a hotel room. There have been a couple of startups that have popped up that are reselling individual rooms that have uh, where, you, where you pay up front and they're non-refundable. But we are the only ones in our space that are reselling group rooms. So. Eventually, when competitors try to enter our space, one, right now we have a first to market advantage, so we need to move as quickly as possible to capture as much market share as we can. We also have a provisional patent that will help slow down or prevent uh, those start startups from entering our space. We're building a strong brand that will keep uh, our client base with us. As far as the 800 pound gorillas go, they charge hotels significant fees, and hotels do not want to work with them. They're kind of stuck with them. Now that we don't charge them anything, and we're bringing in more customers and opportunities to create additional revenue, they're going to want to work with us and not work with the people that charge them uh, high fees. So the co-founding team is myself. I have a background in event marketing, PR, and business development. Tom Murphy is our uh, chief technology officer. He has been the CTO of several event tech startups that have had great exits. And then Teresa Guastella, who's worked on the hotel side and has worked on the event management side, and has experienced this problem from both ends of the spectrum and knows the logistics and nuances of how to solve this. We have several advisors that have, uh, they're well known in the community, as also have a lot of experience in the industry, uh, and we're learning a lot from them. Here are our financial projections over the next five years. A couple things to note. One, an extremely high, uh, actually got cut off. Extremely high profit margin. We have about a 97% profit margin, gross profit margin. Actually, sorry. Uh, and the ability to be profitable uh, the year after next. We're looking to raise $1.4 million with the bulk of the funds going to help us fund partnerships, sales and marketing efforts, some additional <coughs> software integrations, payroll, and operations. Our exit strategy is ultimately to be acquired either by Cvent, who has a premium product for large groups and doesn't really capture the smaller group market. And then Group 360, which does have a foothold in the small market, but if we're siphoning off uh, market share from them, they might want to buy their book of business back from us. In summary, we have a high profit margin business and experienced team, the ability to scale fast with proprietary technology. Thank you. All right. Do we have any questions for Michael? Fair enough. You know, have you uh, approached Marion the way of the Sheraton's and Hilton's? At the property level, yes, not at the corporate brand level. Oh, why not? Why, why not at the corporate uh, If you have an introduction, I'm happy to talk <laughs> to you. No, I'm just wondering if there it starts on. I mean, you do a presentation up in uh, the big hill up there in Washington, and yeah. the Marriott. I mean, I went to headquarters right now, and I think that would be a great opportunity. David Marriott is the new CEO now. I mean, Mr. Marriott has retired. I worked for Marriott for 22 years. Yeah, I mean, we would like to get connected at the, at the brand level, at the corporate level. Um, really, where the problem occurs is at the property level. So that's why we're talking to the group sales staff, the GM, as well as the planners themselves. So they're the ones who are sort of boots on the ground and have to deal with this uh, uh, 
firsthand. But yeah, I would, I would like to get more sense like this. Why the name Room Right? You gotta buy a room. Buy it right, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like everything except for I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I agree. I want to suggest that there is a great opportunity for everyone in this room to take advantage of what you just laid out. I remember when I went out to uh, Laguna Niguel at the Ritz Carlton, the Mutual of Omaha sales leaders, we were actually there at the same time as the Molson Group from Canada was. We were there with a bunch of incredible people. So that's what I'm saying. We can mirror off what you have there. We can search by the industry, by the by the uh, type of, and let's say there's 10 people in this room that want to go to see an associate, because if you're at the same hotel room as another large group from a, a Fortune 500 company, you're going to rub shoulders with them. And we can network and connect with those people to learn right. for our own businesses. Your question? That was, I just, that was a okay. suggestion or just a recommendation. Josh, no, question. So if I'm an event organizer and I've got these excess rooms, I have to put it on your site 30 days in advance? No, you can put it, uh, the recommended time frame is anywhere from 60 to 120 days before your event. At 30 days uh, before your event, the hotel actually has the right to take those rooms back from you, any, ones that, any rooms that haven't been filled, and try to resell it themselves. What we're hoping to do is in that 30 day window where they're gonna resell it anyway, they say, let us resell it for you to consumers, which opens up our market size. Uh, but now you don't have to pay Priceline a commission to sell those rooms. We're going to do it for free. And you can add a minimum food and beverage credit, which brings additional. That's, that's the part that didn't come through. So you're doing what the hotel would have done anyways, but now it benefits. At that 30 day window, yes. But bef or before the 30 day window, no one else is doing that. They're stuck. <laughs> yeah, somebody good to talk to might be Harris Rosen or Rosen Hotel. Have you, have you spoken to them? Nope. Because they have a lot of, you know. Yeah, they do. And they're very innovative. Question? Big program convention over there. So. Yeah, you, on one slide there, you presented a list of possible partnerships and alliances, and, and maybe I misunderstood. Have you actually formed any of those partnerships and alliances yet, or is that just your possibility? So, yeah, so we've talked to Visit Orlando, we've talked to Experience, to Experience Kissimmee, which are both the uh, visitor convention bureaus uh, for the respective counties. They're, what they're most interested in, uh, in terms of a partnership, is they already have all the data for groups that come here. They don't have, they have little to no data for consumers. So they're saying if we could share consumer data, that 30 day window where we could resell, they'll work with us because they don't have access to the individuals that are coming here. So it's coming, it's just not executed yet. Okay, uh, Rod? Mike. So, as you were saying this, I always like to make things super simple, and I'm thinking your stub hub for hotel rooms. There you go. I agree, and I've, I actually said that at Rollins. Uh, I think when I said it, I confused it. I agree with you completely, but I think some people who may not be familiar with stub hub, it's like, is that like Ticketmaster? Are you reselling a bunch of rooms at Priceline? But, you know, but, but I agree with you. Yeah. There, there's there's got to be maybe stub hub may not be the exact, but Seed Geek or something like that, sure. where you can come up with a resale market. That gives this because it, it, it's got to be super quick and right up front. If you would have said that, it would have made it, everybody immediately know exactly what you were doing. I agree. Um, so on one of the slides, it's like a minimum seven percent cost. Yes. What's your biggest challenge? It's pretty healthy, <laughs> but it's uh, expensive. So some of the like hosted buyer events, for example, that we're going to go to later this month, it's like that seven thousand dollars a pop just to just the registration. So you got to do that throughout the year, plus hotels and food and planes. So a lot of get a lot of our uh, upper SGNA costs get eaten up there. So it's pretty high, but net it's it's low. I've identified a major threat. Uh, to to your business model, okay. what what have you identified as your biggest threat? The biggest threat is every uh, event person that we've talked to loves the concept. Even the the visitor Orlando's are saying this is the best time to launch this, and you can tell they're not just you know, blowing smoke. It's you can see the reaction change. The challenge is when we're saying uh, this is what we do. It's wonderful you know, can you list your rooms? They'll say, well, who else have you worked with? Because we just launched, we yeah. So nobody wants to be the first. That's my challenge. 
Oh, you mean the one to overcome? It'll take time, but yeah. 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 Or that's not the one I ended up with. So, what is the threat? <laughs> the individual uh, property manager. How's that? They are not, they, they can make decisions that aren't constrained by the corporate. Yes. And uh, a lot of the people, that, that's when politics come into play. And so they're more apt to take the idea and, and approach their cousin or somebody else that they know or whatever and say, hey, you should do this or whatever. Or, you know, or maybe they just don't like strangers or they don't like you or they don't like something else it's it's i've seen that the only the only comment that we've got in that area is you know if you're at a disney hotel you probably don't get political but you probably don't want an ra an nra convention going to a disney hotel sure so they want to know <laughs> who is staying there but they're not opposed to us reselling because Again, they're going to lose their existing customer. They have nobody staying in those rooms, which means there's nobody to also order room service or spend money in any of the other problem centers. So they want those rooms filled. And that's right. why they say 30 days before, uh, we're going to resell them on our own. OK, well, we can start off with that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I question, from the hotel's perspective, if they, it's, so the event who's coming in has paid $180,000 for this block of rooms. Yeah. 30 days before the event, the hotel gets those rooms, the, the unused rooms back to resell. Yeah. If they work with you, they don't get any money. They get they get people in those rooms who may purchase other things, right? But it seems like the hotel would want to sell those rooms at a rate much higher because they are short on rooms. And so they're gonna lose rent, it sounds like. No, so what the, the hotel does is they're gonna charge their the group that's staying there for the empty rooms. So either way those rooms are covered. Correct. Yes, they want to resell those rooms, mm -hmm. but they're going to have to pay a commission. And there's no guarantee that if you go stay there, that you're going to spend money at the bar, at the restaurants, at the spa. Just because you stay there doesn't mean there's going to be additional revenue there. What we're saying is you can require a minimum food and beverage spend, so you're getting more money for that room than you would if you sold it on your own, and we're not charging a commission. So they have, they have several reasons to want to let us resell it for them. I don't know if I answered the question. I guess my thought is <coughs> these hotels are in places that are bringing in money. Yeah. It might be better for the hotel to just sell it to consumers. Like, you know, they can get, so, you know, just for an example, I paid seven to $800 a night down in Fort Lauderdale for a shit hotel. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so <laughs> if a hotel can sell those rooms for much higher than they normally would, or we could pay them, or we yeah. Would pay so, so there is some seasonality there. You're right. So if they know it's spring break in, in Miami, they can triple the rates. They're going to do that. But there's also times of the year where they they struggle to do that. And there's also certain markets that they struggle to sell rooms, even at the at, at a lower rate. So yeah, there's going to be some circumstances where they don't work with us. Both of your points. But there's many circumstances where they benefit to do. Yes, Rob. One more question. What's your marketing strategy as far as grassroots, not necessarily grassroots, but through your social media, targeting online marketing? Are you going to target the property managers? Do you have strategies for that? You know, what, what's your marketing strategy? So yeah, so on the hotel side, which we, we don't want to spend a lot of our resources in the short term doing, there's an organization called SHMAI, Hotel Sales and Marketing Association International. That's exactly who we want to meet with. So we've sponsored luncheons, we've gone to their events, we've networked. Um, uh, but again, that's not where we want to spend a lot of our time. A lot of our money and time is being spent on associations like Meeting Planners International, the Professional Convention Management Association. What about individual property centers. managers going after them individually and building those individual relationships? It would, it would take a lot of time to do, and it's not, it's not as scalable as some of the other things that we're going to do. Digital marketing, yes, we're doing LinkedIn ads, uh, content creation, about to launch Google ads because you can see how many people are searching group blocks in Utah, for example, um, so targeting those. But we have other strategies as well. Okay. One more question? Are you planning on just doing this you know, across North America, or are you going to target market first? I mean, you're in a great area with Orlando. 
Atlanta, right? Second largest yep. you know, hotel room. Yes. Are you going to target market it first here, or are you going to try to just pull everywhere? So we're going to go where the the market demand is. So as we're talking to to events and meeting professionals, they're telling us, you know, I'm I'm doing well in Miami, but I'm struggling in Austin. Uh, so that's where we're going to go. They're going to tell us where their their need is. We have the ability to to work with any hotel in the U.S. One of the things that we're still developing is the, the currency converter, so we can go international. Uh, but technologically, there's nothing really stopping us other than uh, the currency converter. You have a lot of stuff to figure out right now. Then you target market on an area with a lot of hotel rooms, yeah. right? It doesn't need to be Orlando, Florida, or something. You're going to learn a lot of lessons. You try to go you know, across the country, and you're going to run into a lot of costs that you probably could have saved. And our final question, what can we as the Orlando Chapter of One Million Cups? You already did it. Uh, you provided feedback, asked insightful questions, um, and you, you gave me some, you know, your time, and I appreciate that. And, and, and then, you know, of course, the obvious question is, what do you think Disney has against the National Rafters Association? <laughs> 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 All right, thank you, Clayton. Right. <laughs> How many slides do you have of this? We're going back and forth. One million. Shark Tank, and I'm here for a very specific reason to get feedback on the sticking point we had. So, presenting Helms House Orlando. Helms House is uh, back to when I was teaching middle school English years and years ago. My students and I read a book that had hidden within the text clues to a real life treasure hunt. The author guaranteed that. He had treasures hidden across the country. Each of them was within one day's drive of somewhere in the United States. I was hooked. This was a really cool idea. My students were so engaged. I mean, we really tried it. We saw none of it. We got no treasure, but we tried. I thought this would be a really cool thing to do here in Orlando. Get people out of the house, out doing things, walking around, looking. You know, fast forward 20 years and Pokemon Go fulfilled that, that vision. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, I was the founder of the Florida Blogger and Social Media Conference, a company I actually present here at One Million Cups back in 2014, years ago when I used to come fairly regularly. Um, it was a one-day gathering of the state's biggest bloggers, influencers, marketers, and my husband and I also founded Florida Swim Network, which live streams swim meets back before live streaming was mainstream. In fact, we got so good at it, we were hired by ESPN and the SEC Network to live stream their competitions. Both those companies were acquired before COVID, and I leaned into the digital marketing. I'm now donating some of my time to nonprofits, specifically for this time around at Second Harvest Food Bank. And the challenge was, course, raising money, but we wanted to do it in a creative way. We didn't want to have a silent auction. We didn't want to have a big event. And me, with my digital background, said, what can we sell digitally? What can we do over and over and over and over and get a little piece of that download every time as a donation? The treasure hunt, an armchair treasure hunt came to mind. So introducing Hound's House Orlando. It is an armchair treasure hunt. We have the tagline, the magic chooses you, because in the story, 
A recent UCF grad discovers there's magic hidden in plain sight right here in Orlando. There are mythical creatures that actually date back to the legends of some of the earliest indigenous Floridians or natives. And we describe it as Harry Potter meets Pokemon Go because once the reader finishes the story, and the story is about Hound's House, a secret society that's in charge of discovering and finding those mythical creatures, keeping them safe from anybody that might just misuse their powers, the reader's invited to join Hound's House and actually go on the treasure hunt. So they declude codes or clues right in the actual text. And then they go out. Oh, this is the wrong slide. Let me go forward. There we go. Sorry. It got cut and paste twice. Sorry. So they download and they actually look for the locations. They go out into the real world, out into Orlando, out of the house, away from their screens to some hidden locations. They find the QR code, snap it. They are taken to a page where they are given not only a discount or a little reward for that location, whether it's a scoop of ice cream or a discount on a purchase, but they're also given a clue towards the grand prize, which is a cash prize of $3,000. That's the incentive to get people to download. That cash prize is made up from the hidden locations. We have 10 hidden locations that people go to, and this was my challenge. So we had some locations that were easy to deep because we want the reader to feel confident, feel like they're doing something. Oh man, I'm smart enough to figure this out. My students and I were not smart enough to figure out the original one. So we wanted the reader to have some confidence. And we have some moderately difficult locations to decode. And then we have some really difficult ones. And those are our pacers. We didn't want this to be solved in one weekend because that would limit the number of downloads that we would get. And so we wanted to make sure that we spread it out. The hunt lasts for 10 weeks total. And so for the difficult locations, we're actually holding back a few clues that we'll give out on social media throughout the 10 weeks to make sure that we're pacing somebody finding that grand prize. Benefits come, obviously. If you are an easy to find location, you're gonna pay more because you're gonna get more foot traffic. You also get some added benefits. If you're a difficult location, difficult to decode, you won't pay quite as much because you won't get quite as much input traffic. So the potential results of this, right now, because of the, it's a beta test for us, we're having just $2. That's just about all of the royalties we book. It's on Amazon. So $2 go to Second Harvest Food Bank. Uh, we would like to, if this does work this time around, scale again next time, go with the traditional publisher to where we then and provide a greater royalty to the Second Harvest Food Bank or to a nonprofit that's going to be duplicated. If the grand prize is not found by the deadline, the 3000 also goes to the nonprofit. And there is a virtual version. We have it scaled to where somebody living in Mississippi could play. Or if somebody is homebound, they can play. That way they can participate. We also then get those downloads. So here are my asks, and this is where I ran into problems. We assumed that the hidden locations, it was a benefit for them. We were bringing them foot traffic to their door. We were guaranteeing them future revenue because they provide a discount code or a freebie or something with a purchase. That was a much harder sell than I anticipated it being. We heard a lot of no's for a lot of different reasons. Some did not understand the project. And that's probably my fault for not being able to explain it well. And so my messaging probably is off on it. That's part of the ask that I have for you. And the second is, you know, how do I show the value to these locations that they will be getting that foot traffic and future revenue? That was a challenge for me this time around that I didn't expect. So that is probably my biggest ask for you. And then finally, you know, it, it is in it is in beta right now. We are doing a test run right now. If we find that it pans out, we get a lot of downloads, we drive traffic, we are able to you know, track how many people scan the QR codes to at the different locations. If it works out, we can duplicate this. We can
can replicate it not only here in Orlando, do it a second time, we do a Hounds House Miami, we do a Hounds House Atlanta, team with a nonprofit in each place. So questions? That, that's my, my ask. So I told you I wasn't at that. I just love it. Pretty sure I understand the concept. In other words, you're yep. going to charge people so much for depending on which challenge they decide. No, they download them. So, yeah, what's the stop? Let's say that that uh, we want to try the easy one. And it's what, $150 a person? No, 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 so we're relying a little bit on this being good faith because it is for a nonprofit. Nine dollars is not a big ask for somebody. Certainly, they could share it with them. However, if I was wanting to win that three thousand dollars, I probably would not be sharing too much with other people. So yes, that is a, a calculated chance we're taking with that. But that is a good question. I agree. What is what the vendor has to pay? Fiction or foot traffic? So it's like marketing. Yep. Yeah, they write it off as marketing. Yeah. So if I have a restaurant, uh, the thing you're promising me is foot traffic? Yes. Is that it? Can, can I give a coupon or a discount? To yep. people that so, show up and... so when they scan the QR code, what pops up is a discount. In fact, we're requiring them to offer a discount or a like a free scoop of ice cream or a discount on a future purchase. So not only do you get that future revenue, but the consumer who has scanned the QR code gets a little reward for having found the right place. Then they also get the clue towards the grand prize. Okay, there's a lot of partner with you. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. See, I was thinking that. <laughs> yeah. okay. there, there's, well, a big, there's a big caveat here where a lot of these foot traffic places, they end up losing big time because they'll have the foot traffic come in there. People don't take advantage of the discount. They don't take advantage of any of that. And they go through all this extra effort. Retailers that I've worked with in past vent, um, ventures have done that. What are you going to do to mitigate that it's a burden on the business? Because I understand you think it'll be a benefit for them, but what if, what if it's a burden and how are you going to keep it from being a burden? Yep. So all we're requiring of them is a QR code that's a four by four to be stuck and we recommend it near the cash register, but they can put wherever they think is best for their location. So that is the only ask we have for them. Otherwise we handle everything for them. Well, no, but I'm saying that the foot traffic doesn't convert. So you got people coming in and taking up their employee resources, yeah. all these other kinds of things. So how can you make sure that that business, because a lot of these retailers have been burned mm -hmm. by different things. And so you're gonna have, you got a small restaurant, they don't have the staff to sit there and answer questions because that will happen. So what, what kind of scenario are you gonna build around that to help them mitigate that? That's it. I mean, that's that's a really good point that we haven't considered yet. So thank okay. you for bringing that. Yeah. So maybe that's why I'm hearing some notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I just have a really simple question. Yeah. This book, mm -hmm. um, is it good just as a standalone It book? is good just as a So for me, I'm actually wearing three marketing hats right now mm -hmm. as the founder of this project. The first one is the why I'm here for the business <coughs> side of it. How do I structure it? How do I get it? working as a model for a nonprofit fundraiser. My second one is marketing. Hey, there's a treasure hunt, guys. You all can win $3,000. Don't you want to participate? And then my third one is as an author promoting a new book. So yeah, it is just a standalone book. That is a great read. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's, it's been beta tested, professionally edited. We had a focus group read it, so it's a good book. Do you save at all on expenses, on expenses or on costs if someone does just Keep it that that it does not save me at all. Okay. No, nope, um, because I have no I have no further money output whether you hunt or not. Because it's already been the prize has already been paid for by the, the relocation. Okay. You know, uh, Taj and uh, Abdullah are on a Tuesday app. We are in this business. Happy Allah. I just Oh, thank you. I would love that. Thank you. Uh, I love the concept. I think it's great. I'm excited. And uh, the QR code, if somebody finds it, they can just 
not knowing what they're doing, they can get all the information they need to join in. So they can. So if somebody were at a restaurant and saw a QR code and was curious about it, they might scan it, in which case it pops up and boy, they got a bonus because they just maybe got 10% off an appetizer or something. But then they also, it's, it's hosted on our website. So if they were to click the top of the website page to go to it, they'd say, oh, well, wow. and so Hound's House Orlando actually explains what it is. They could then download and join in. So yes. So there was a thing on Groupon that was like a treasure hunt Orlando or something. It was a day to go mm -hmm. see cool stuff. So have you, and you said this was 30 days? This is 10 weeks. 10 weeks, okay. Yeah, yeah, so. So do you think that's too long? You know, that was the question that we had with, that was a discussion we have with Second Harvest because they've never had a fundraiser go beyond really one week. Their campaigns are, they said we've never go one beyond, beyond one week. And so I, I hearken back to, armchair treasure hunt is actually a genre of literature. There are armchair treasure hunts that people have done for decades. In fact, one of the most famous, mm -hmm. Finn's Forest or something like that, the author hid treasure, he was in Europe, hid all these treasures, and then he died. So nobody knows the answers. And it's, there's like, if you Google Finn's Forest, you'll see all these Facebook groups dedicated to sharing clues, trying to find it. And so that's why I liken it to Pokemon Go. It's kind of an ongoing thing. So when I explained that to Second Harvest, I said, obviously, we want to have an end date to it. But I said, if we, if we shorten it, the word of it trickling out. I don't want somebody to find out about it a week before it ends. So I, we decided on, originally we, we thought 16, and then we decided June 30th would be the end date. So we're doing 10 weeks. It launches April 15th. We're trying to build as much buzz for the launch to have you know pre-orders done, that way people start hunting right away. But again, we have the Pacer, um, we have the Pacer locations that I hope, I mean, there's a lot of smarty pants out there. So I hope they're not going to figure it out until we give out those final kind of ciphers on on social media for them to find those final four locations. Um, but the 10 weeks is what we wanted to, we decided to land on. But that is a good question. Would it be too long? But we didn't want to have it too short to where people did not find out about it and didn't have time to download and participate. Quick question. Question. Question about the loan for the yeah. employees. I think um, the incentive for the employees to engage in that would be if those people would come by, ask them a question, or uh, finish. Well, for right now, we actually have had a, all the locations sign a, a non-disclosure. And that went back, that was a recommendation from attorneys, from legal, because uh, y'all remember McDonald's used to do the hunts, and then there was a whole thing about where they told people where it was, and so it was unfair. So they said, even, even the individual locations don't know the other locations. And so the people that I signed with, that contracted with, they signed an NDA, and they are only to let employees know on an as-needed basis. So I imagine the employees are gonna be like, I have no idea what that's for. But Most likely. Give, give the employees a feedback, so to let them engage in this game, yep. people who approach them might throw a phrase or Right. Oh, that's a, that's a good idea. And may, maybe I'll give that as an option. Most most restaurant owners or retail shops said, just put this QR code up. I'm good with that. And then leave me alone. Hey. So I have an, I have an idea on the different locations. Okay. That's my question. You clarify, so the book is about Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to be able to take that to Miami and Boston. So Texas we'll have to have an author write it. Yeah, so the, here's the paperback, three versions. We have the Kindle, the paperback, and an audible version. So we have all three. So if we were to take it on the road, we'd have to contract, uh, contract with, the, with the writer in each one of those locations, which actually offer, offers some great opportunities if that offer has a, a known following already. So it could okay. be some even greater opportunities for that. Are, but you're still trying to find locations, so they're not baked into the book, per se. No, okay. no. So actually, at the very end is the Queen's Pillow, and that's what they actually use to solve it. So they could have the book written, 
Once a location center found, they write the poem for them to then use. <coughs> yeah, good question. And that was actually, those book has been written for over a year now, and we just finished up wrapping up the 10 locations, so we had to do the poems last. First of all, congratulations. It's really, really smart. Oh, yeah. thank you. If it works. <laughs> only if it works, then. <laughs> it will work. Uh, my first question, actually the only question, is that you're using the physical QR code, right? Yes. Well, have you thought about using virtual QR codes? That way you won't depend on any business to put it on its place. I have no like you idea can how connect that works. A, You can connect <laughs> the location you want to QR code be found yep. to a very accurate GPS location that are to beat accurate. So when your user, exactly. when your user appears in that location, that QR code will appear on his phone, and then you can scan it. So that way, that's that, that's that's my next one. I love it. I like that. Yeah. And you will, you will be able to collect the initial users before depending or asking businesses to help you with that. And then well, remember the businesses though. Give me the grand prize. I don't want to give three thousand of my money out. <laughs> so you could you could offer this up to national sponsorship then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. then you're not limited to, 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 my question was going to be, what are the roadblocks that you've seen? Is it finding those locations that are really up the money? Yeah, okay. yeah. So then what you need to do is, re, is expand your sponsorship ability. Mm -hmm. And so if you use geo-targeting to have it be a Pokemon Go drive-by pop-up, then now you, Pepsi would do it. Mm -hmm. Coke would do it. Right. You know, all Probably the other things. You know, so uh, I, I've got another idea but where you can convert any book into this as well. Oh, right. I love that. Uh, we're uh, we're going to finish up with Robert and Pamela. And so you touched upon it earlier in the very beginning. How can you make this more simple? No. I don't think it's that difficult, but obviously my explaining of it is. I mean, it is. So for me, the key points are, so we, we landed on download, decode, and do good for the tagline. Download the book, decode, decode the clues, and you're doing good for the second harvest food bank. Go on a treasure hunt. So, you know, there's only three steps to it. Download the book and read. Go to locations. Maybe win the prize. So I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, I do need to work on that because... There is still a barrier with people understanding, and I fully take that on me with the messaging. Just just because it's a nonprofit doesn't mean that you're not trying to provide value to the participants. So I think you need to be clear on that. Okay, so what is the value then? Is it the good book? No. Is it the three thousand no. dollars? Is it the reward? No. What is it? It's the doing good. The doing good. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking that same thing. It's, you got to promote the yep. idea of the nonprofit. They want to feel good doing good. Yeah. And you so, play up the aspect of it being for a nonprofit. Absolutely. Not also, necessarily a nonprofit, but just no. doing good. Okay. Something. All right, good. Feedback. Thank you. All right. So, that, that I guess was my question on which of the three um, sort of buckets that you identify as falling into is going to be like your thing that you advertise as like what this is for you. <clears throat> Um, but I was going to describe it as like you're either a, a how to printer or an idea printer, and yours feels more like so. Like, it, it, it feels like it's a more easy route to tell people this is what I do if it's like I'm going to be a business coach and I'm going to tell you how to do a thing. But if it's like this whole idea you have around a concept, and then like that, the how you're helping people is hidden somewhere within that. Um, and then you're also multi passionate because I have that as well within my business. I struggled a lot with my messaging on. So we're, we're teaching creative writing, we're teaching improv theater, um, we're doing workshops, but we're producing shows, um, but we're helping teams. So, like, what's the thing that we do? Um, and for me, it became so we're a teen theater company. The other things are just like, like this is. This is the like this is the who we are and what we do, but then the other things are just like these are ways we go about like doing that and this is the problem we're solving, but that's not like our main thing. So you kinda have to figure out like which of the three is the like most varied. So it sounds like folks are saying like your your uh, fundraising for social enterprises um, is the biggest of the three versus we're a treasure hunt or we're a new book. Um, and so that's what that was going to be. Excellent feedback, thank you. All right, thank you everyone, and you did partially uh, answer this.
But as One Million Cups uh, Orlando chapter, what can we do for you? Well, you guys helped with uh, helping be back on number one. The second one is, you know, if you have anybody that likes to read, spread word. It is a good book. If you like to read, um, and then, you know, you can go on a treasure hunt and maybe win 3000 Okay. Please, thank you. question or comment we encourage you to get with the presenters afterwards and please continue the conversation you know we do have a time limit and we want to respect everybody's time we want to respect our presenters times so, thank you very much I want you to go to the website I would I would do it right now but where's the QR code to lead me to where I'm supposed to go that should be right here <laughs> right here <laughs> But he, 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 he's got a good point. You're talking QR codes? Yeah. Put it everywhere. Yeah. Where, where's your QR code to white label the book? Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Paul, uh, yeah, you know, thank you again to both our presenters and to all the great questions and, and feedback. I'm so sorry. I left glasses up here someplace. Maybe. What are these yours? They are mine. Sorry, Scott. They don't match my shoes. <laughs> 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 yeah, nice shoes. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. Wait, well, like I said, you know, uh, follow us, share, discuss, uh, say really, really good things about One Million Cups on all your favorite social medias, and even a couple of your not-so-favorite ones. Say nice things about us there, too. Um, and if you've made a connection with somebody, there are coffee shops and snack shops and park benches that you can go and sit down with somebody and have a conversation um, all over town. And so we encourage you to take the conversations and the community out into the rest of your lives and, and, and bring those connections along with you. So we appreciate uh, you doing that. Uh, next week, uh, we do have one presenter. We are still looking for another presenter. So if you have been here a few times and you have applied, has anybody applied to present? Okay, um, if you've applied, please get with Josh and we'll get you converted over to a presenter. Um, and if you haven't applied, why not? <laughs> Thank you very much and we will see you all next week. Yeah.